Dahl and encounters some of his characters in the South Bank show. of December 1939. Dear Mama, I'm having a lovely time. I've never enjoyed myself so much. I've been sworn into the RAF proper and am definitely in it now to the end of the war. I did my first solo flight some days ago and now go up alone for longish periods every day. Initial training took eight weeks, and at the end of it, we could fly upside down and get ourselves out of a spin. We could do forced landings with the engine cut. We could side slip and land in a crosswind and navigate in cloud. We were full of confidence. Just learn to loop to loop, and the next thing we've got to learn is flying upside down. When I got into the cockpit for the first time and sat down on my parachute, my entire head stuck up into the open air. The engine was running, and I was getting a rush of wind full in the face from the slipstream. You are in a metal cockpit where just about everything is made of riveted aluminium. There is a plexiglass hood over your head and a sloping bulletproof windscreen in front of you. Your right hand is on the stick and your right thumb is on the brass firing button on the top loop of the stick. What a very nice way to fight a war. Is the tiny magic area of absolute blackness. Are you sure you want to go through with this? The mind will cease fidgeting. Nothingness. Boys who break rules must be punished. How many young men, I kept asking myself, were lucky enough to be allowed to go whizzing and soaring through the sky. Even the aeroplane and the petrol were free. 
What a fortunate fellow I am, I kept telling myself. The instructor said, are you sure you want to go through with this? Yes, I replied. Here's the lucky nights. Nose holes are usually slightly larger than most people's. The rims are horrid, all pink and crumpy, like the rims of certain seashells. Why do they have such big nose holes? For smelling with you juggins. A real witch has a truly amazing sense of smell. Did you know she could sniff out a child standing on the opposite side of the road? on a jet black night. She couldn't smell me. I just had a bath. That's just why she called. The cleaner you are, the more smelly you be to a witch. That can't be true. Are you calling me a liar, young man? A totally clean child gives out the most fearsome stench to a witch. The dirtier you are, the less you smell. Simple as that. But that doesn't make sense, Grandma. Oh, yes, it does, because it isn't the dirt the witch is smelling, it's you. The smell that drives a witch bonkers is actually coming right out of your own skin. It oozes out of your skin in waves, stink waves, the witch has got. And these waves go floating through the air and hit the witch, wham! Smacking the nostrils. <laughs> they send a real. Now, wait a minute, Grandma. Don't interrupt. The point is this when you haven't had a bath for a week and are all covered in dirt, well, then naturally it stands to reason the stink waves can't come oozing out half as strong there. I shall never bath again. Oh, don't be so silly. Just don't have one quite so often, that's all. Once a month, ample for any sensible child. Grandma? Hmm? If it's a dark night... Yes? How can the witch smell the difference between a child and a grown-up? Darling, a grown-up doesn't give out stink waves. Only children do that. But I don't really give out stink waves, do I? I'm not giving them out at this very moment, am I? Well, not to me or not. To me, you smell of raspberries and cream. But to a witch, you'd be smelling absolutely disgusting. <laughs> what would I be smelling of? Dog's droppings. Dog's droppings? I don't smell of dog's droppings. I don't believe it. I won't believe it. What's more, you'd be smelling of fresh dog stoppings. That can't be true. I don't smell of dog stoppings, stale or fresh. There's no point in arguing about it. It's a fact of life. I'm going to rinse you now. There's a bit more you ought to know about witches. Like what, Mr. Darth? Well, witches aren't actually women at all. They look like women, and they talk like women, and they act like women. But the truth is that they're, they're totally different animals. They're demons in human shape. What else is different about them? The 
feet. They don't have any toes. No toes? Then what do they have? They just have feet. They have square feet with no toes on the end of them. Does that make it difficult to walk? Not at all. But they do have a problem with their shoes. They have an awful job getting their square witch's feet into these tiny little pointed lady shoes. Are those the only differences? There's one more. What is it? Their spit is blue. Blue? Not blue. Their spit can't be blue. It's as blue as the juice of a bilberry. You don't mean it. No one can have blue spit. Witches can. Is it like ink? It's exactly like ink. As a matter of fact, they use it to write with. They use those old-fashioned pens that have nibs. And they just lick the nibs. If you look closely, you can see a bluish tinge on their teeth. Can you really notice the blue spit? Only if you look closely. I would, if she spat. Well, they never do that, no. They've got to be very careful. A real witch has truly amazing powers of smells. She could sniff a child out who was standing on the opposite side of the road on a jet black night. That can't be true. Did you ever meet a witch? Once, only once. What happened? I'm not going to tell you. Frighten you to death. Please tell us. Oh, please. No, no, please, no, please no, 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 some things are too horrible to talk about. You're late. Prince round back. They cut it off with one big whack. This pleased the prince. He smiled and said, She's prettier without a head. Jack was nimble. Jack was keen. He scrambled up the mighty bean. Up. Up he went without a stop, but just as he was near the top, a ghastly, frightening thing occurred. Not far above his head he heard a big, deep voice, a rumbling thing that made the very lecterns ring. It shouted loud, fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman. I'm going to give you six. Boys who break rules have to be punished. But, sir, I, I had a bus nip, sir. That's no excuse. Six. Take up the position, boy. Buttocks tighter, boy, tighter. I saw him, Mum. My gizzard froze. A giant 
with a clever nose. A clever nose is rather hissed. You must be going round a twist. He smelled me out. I swear it, Mum. He said he smelled an Englishman. The mother said, and well she might, I've told you every single night to take a bath because you smell. If you're so clean, why don't you climb the crazy thing? Would you do it? Would you hell? You even make your mother shriek because of your unholy smell. A bath does seem to pay. I'm going to have one every day. Let me go. I'm hungry. I'm famished. So am I. Everyone's famished. Aren't you hungry? Oh, no, hold it one moment. Children, please, sir. Now, James. Just remember that in this story you have just crept into this giant peach and you've come across these ginormous hungry insects that you think are about to gobble you up. So if you are about to be gobbled up by ginormous hungry insects, tell me, how would you be feeling about it? I'd be scared, miss. That's right, James. So please, don't be more scared. Okay, so from your last line, Miss Spider. Aren't you hungry? You look positively ill. He looks as though he's going to faint any second. Oh my goodness, the poor thing. I do believe he thinks it's him we're wanting to eat. Down with children, do them in. Boil their bones and fry their skin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that's good. Uh, Yes, carry on. You mustn't be frightened. We wouldn't dream of hurting you. I've been waiting all day long for this. So cheer up, my boy. Cheer up. I'm a little forward. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You've got lots of boots. I have lots of legs and a lot of feet. One hundred feet, sir. No, no, not yet, Cloudman. What am I seeing? I'm seeing a revolt inside. I'm seeing a rotten, repulsive. There he goes again. He can't stop telling lies about his legs. He doesn't have anything like 100 of them. He's only got 42. The poor fellow. He's blind, you know. He can't see how splendid I look. In my opinion, the really marvellous thing is to have no legs at all and be able to walk just the same. Down with children. Do them in. Boil their bones and fry their skin. Pish them, squish them, bash them, mash them, break them, shake them, smash them, smash them. I offer chocks with a magic powder. Say, eat up, then say it louder. Cram them full of sticky eats, send them home still guzzling sweets. In, in the morning, little fools go marching off to separate schools. A girl feels sick, she goes all pale and yells, hey, look, I grow a tail. A boy who's standing next to her. Is screaming, help! I'm growing fur. Another shouts, we look like freaks, there's whiskers going on our cheeks. A boy who was extremely tall cries out, what's wrong? I'm growing small. Four tiny legs begin to sprout on everybody on the back. And hungry. all at once, all in a trice, there is no children, only mice. In every school, it's mice galore, all running around the schoolroom floor. And all the poor demented teachers just is yelling, Hey, who are these creatures? They stand upon the desk and shout, Get out, you filthy mice, get out. Will someone fetch the mouse traps, please? And don't forget to bring the cheese. <laughs> The mouse traps come, and every trap goes snippy snip and snippy snap. 
the mousetraps have a powerful spring. The spring goes crack and step and ping. Is lovely noise for us to hear. Is music to a witch's ear. Dead mice in every place around, piled two feet deep upon the ground. With teachers searching left and right, and not a single child in sight. Just then, in a blaze of light, the magic fairy hove in sight. Her magic wand went whoosh, swish. Cindy, she cried, come make a wish. Forgetting the right of every single child in the whole world, in clubs. Their skin, wish them, squish them, bash them, mash them. Break them, shake them, smash them, smash them. It's music to a bit easier. Dead mice is every place around, piled two feet deep upon the ground. The teacher's searching left and right, and not a single child in sight! <laughs> It's full of it. It smells like a sewer. to get off this horrible hill. Come on!
I am seeing I am seeing I am seeing hundreds thousands of Russian rippers, you little children. My orders are that every single child in the whole of this country should be rubbed out, squashed and squirted and fitted. I back, sir, be I buggery. I come staff from where I knows a girl wears calico drawers, and I knows how to tear em. Clouds like mountains tower high above, above their heads on all sides, mysterious, menacing, overwhelming. Gradually it grew darker and darker. Then a pale three-quarter moon came up over the tops of the clouds, cast an eerie light over the whole sea. Hello, Mummy! Who are we? Sounds like Mummy. Now I'm high above the Officer. I want a word with you about all this money. You got some, did you? I'm very happy for you. Don't get smart with me, Sonny. Where do you get it from? I want it. Had a lucky night. Lucky night? Won it? Check it out. Don't worry, son. I will. There is a secret side which only comes out in the writer after he has closed the door of his workroom and is completely alone. It is then that he slips into another world altogether. A world where his imagination takes over and he finds himself actually living in the places he is writing about at that moment. I myself fall into a kind of trance and everything around me disappears. And quite often, 
Two hours go by as though they were a couple of seconds. Everything depends in the end upon the turn of a single card. If you know beforehand what the value of that card is to be, then you are home and dry. Can he do it? Can he be trained to do this thing? It was a lot of money for an hour's work, but it's all too easy. Nothing is any fun if you can get as much of it as you want, including money. Every time I make a bet, I'm certain of winning. There's no thrill, no suspense, no danger of losing. Travel around the world and make millions. But is it going to be any fun doing it? What of the future? Is it not possible that the process he will go through will completely change his life? <laughs> He wondered when the dreaded words would come. And then, from somewhere high above the ground, he heard the giant mutter twice. By gosh, that tasted very nice. Although, and this in grumpy tones, I wish there weren't so many bones. Are you sure you want to go through with this? Yeah. Here's to lucky nights. Hi, Christopher Jack cried, by gum. The giant's eaten up my mum. He smelled her out. She's in his belly. I had a hunch that she was smelly. It's not too late to change your mind. A flame, when you look into it closely, has three separate parts. There is the yellow outside. The mauve inner sheath. And right in the middle, the tiny magic area of absolute blackness. It's not too late to change your mind! Jack was there gazing longingly upon the large and golden tree. He murmured softly, Golly gosh! Yes, I'll have to take a watch! Yes, I'm going to climb this tree without the giant smelling me! Blue Four, can you hear me? Can you hear me? The brain will cease fidgeting around. The brain will cease fidgeting around. Blue Four, speak louder, please. Can you hear me? A low body will feel as if it is actually encased within the flame. The mind will cease fidgeting. The 
mind will cease fidgeting. Speak louder, please. The mind will cease fidgeting. Flame. Snug and cozy within the little black area of nothingness. The flame has three separate parts. There is the yellow outside, the mauve inner sheath, and right in the very center, the tiny magic area of absolute blackness. Vector 035. 40 miles. Angels 8. Vector 035, 40 miles. Angels 8. Is that understood? Received. I'm on my way. trained himself to read the value of a playing card from the reverse side. Our gambler, our rather dishonest gambler, realized he could make a fortune. Stare at the tiny area of absolute blackness. Keep staring at it. After six months fierce and concentrated work, he could do it in 20 seconds. Blue four, can you hear me? The brain will cease fidgeting around. But when you're gambling in a casino, and the dealer is waiting for you to say yes or no, you're not going to be allowed 20 seconds before you make up your mind. Three or four at the most. No more. Listen out within the flame. Within the flame. I'll take another card. night. He knew, of course, that he could travel around the world making millions. But was it going to be any fun? It had been all too easy. No thrill, no suspense, no danger of losing. A melancholy experience. Sergeant. Do you know what happened next to the gambler? The gambler? Yeah, the gambler. Oh, the gambler? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I recall it like it was yesterday, sir. I remember it like it was yesterday. <coughs> I 
I was proceeding about my duties when I came upon a riot in Curzon Street in the West End of London. A young man, the aforementioned gambler, as it transpired, was driving around throwing money, thousands of pounds worth of it, out of his car window in the middle of the street. People was going bonkers. The entire street was blocked. I stood there, stark naked, a red-hot poker in one end and a jar of cold cream. I seized the initiative and approached the vehicle. Where did the money come from, says I. I won it, says he. I had a lucky night. He proceeded to give me the name of the club where he had won the money, and I jotted it down in my little notebook. Check it out, says he. Don't you worry, son. I will, says I. It's only money, says he. You... Oh, and Hess and a Himbecile, says I. If you've been lucky enough to win a big sum of money like that, you don't drive around throwing it in the middle of the street. You could give it where it would do some good. To a hospital, for instance. Or to an orphanage. There's orphanages all over the country that haven't got enough money to give these kids a present at Christmas. And a steaming great pudding like you. Let's never know what it's like to be hard up. Drives around Mayfair, sucking money out of the bloody window. I'm sorry, sir. An orphanage, Sergeant. Yes, sir, an orphanage. I was brought up in one, so I know what it's like. But that's exactly what he did. Did, sir. Orphanages. He founded orphanages. Good day, Sergeant. <laughs> Take a journey through the world of Roald Dahl, today on ITV3. it carefully later that out of the 16 pilots I trained with, no less than 13 were killed in the air within the next two years. In retrospect, one gasps at the waste of life. down beside the sea a wooden spade they gave to me to dig the sandy shore my holes were empty as a cup and every time the sea came up till it could come no more when i was down beside the sea a bucket and spade they gave to me my holes were empty as a cup and every time the sea came up, she kept coming down. Your mother wants you to remember those sunny days. Those sunny days by the sea. Mummy, look what I've found. Oh, look, Mummy, look. Poor baby's got a splinter in his foot. Oh, I'm sorry that must have hurt. Well, I didn't notice anything. What do you mean you didn't notice? Just didn't notice, that's all. I suppose you're going to tell me if I stick the pin right into your foot, you're not going to feel that either. <laughs> well, I didn't say that. <gasps> hey, take it 
take it out. You can poison someone like that. Do you mean you can't feel it? Take it out, will you? Do you mean it doesn't hurt? Yes, yes, the pain is terrible. Take it out. What's the matter with you? I said the pain is terrible. Didn't you hear me? Don't you have to take any notice? What do you mean you didn't notice? Just didn't notice, that's all. Oh, mummy, 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 mummy. I suppose you're going to tell me if I stick the pin right into your foot, you're not going to feel that either. I, I didn't say that. Hey. Oh. oh, mummy, mummy. Take it out, will you? You can poison someone like that. As soon as the wolf began to feel that he would like a decent meal, he went and knocked on Grandma's door. When Grandma opened up, she saw his sharp white teeth, his horrid grin, and Wolfie said, May I come in? Well, Grandmama was terrified. He's going to eat me up, she cried. And she was absolutely right. He ate it up in one big bite. But Grandmama was small and tough, and Wolfie said, That's not enough. I haven't yet begun to feel that I have had a decent meal. He ran around the kitchen yelping, I've got to have a second helping! She stared and then she said, What great big ears you have, Grandma! Blue Four, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Great orders, listen up. All the better to hear you with. Blue Four, can you hear me? Vector 035. 40 miles, Angels 8. What great big eyes you have, Grandma! Ooh, the better to see you with. Bandits overshipping at Calcus. Received. I'm on my way. He sat there watching her and smiled. He thought, I'm going to eat this child. Compared with their old Grandma, she's going to taste like caviar. But, Grandmama, what a lovely big furry coat you have on. That's wrong! Have you forgot to tell what big teeth I've got? Ah, oh, well, no matter what, I'm gonna eat you! Miss Riding Hook, but what a change. No cloak of red, no silly hood upon her head. She said, hello, and please do note my lovely furry wolfskin coat. What exactly was your relationship with Goldilocks, Ronald? Are you trying to insinuate something? It is, Ronald, isn't it? No. You are on a military station. I am allowed to be. I'm a pilot officer. Not any longer, mate. You never change. You always are what you were. I was a child once, I still am. Oh, yeah. What you got in that case? Nothing that would interest you. What do you mean by that? Just a few random prejudices. Prejudices? Prejudices? Things you pick up as you wander along through life. Oh, yeah.
What sort is it? That's Goldilocks. Okay, that's a cartoon. She's not real. It's your old friend, Goldilocks. Well, it's not real. Well, she is. We all have her ups and downs. Yes. Hey, that's me. Violence. I hate violence. Oh, I love it. I love a bit of violence. Yes. I love it. Mm. Yes. Had a very good war. I hate war, Sergeant. I hate ruins and bombing. You've mm. seen enough of it. See, you make a living by it, don't you? Yeah, I do. It's my job. It's yeah. sort of now. Yeah, you like it? No, no, I get you brought up. I abhor it. Yeah. Mm. And that's, that's a hurricane. That's, uh, that's the loveliest of aeroplanes. Oh, I like, I like spit by myself. That's yeah, my favourite. I love that. Yeah, I used to watch them when I was a boy and I did dog fights up in the sky. Yeah. I did? Yeah. yeah, it was good. Chocolates. Now, you see, that's not a prejudice, Sergeant. That's a preference with me. That's I've you loved like... them all my life. Put sweet tooth in, you know? Yes, mm. yes, what there are left of them. Oh, you're in very good shape, then. Yeah. Nice and slim. Yes. But you know about chocolates. No, I don't like such. England has the finest range of what we used to call Tuppany bars. Tuppany bars. Uh, chocolate bars in the world. Yeah. And you know when they... I'll tell you something might interest you. Do you know when all the great Tuppany bars that we eat today were invented? No. Well, the first one was the Dairy Milk Flake, okay. 1920. Mm. And then there was a long period uh, of sterility. Sterility, yes. And, and, and then came the 30s, which in, in, the, in the chocolate world is the equivalent to the, I expect you've heard of the, the, the Italian Renaissance in pictures. Renaissance? Oh, well, he's Italian actor, wasn't he? The Visconti. I remember the Visconti. Renaissance. He's good, isn't he? <laughs> he had it with that uh, lowly bridge. Lowly, lowly, lowly bridge he did. She's a good. Uh, you know her? You're a great citizen. Well, right. anyway, anyway, the 30s is it. It was equivalent in the chocolate world to the Italian Renaissance. All the great chocolate bars we eat today, curious enough, were invented in the 30s. 50, 60 years ago. Very interesting, Robert. Yes, it Very is. Since the war, nothing in the 50s, 60s, 70s, to my mind anyway, as a connoisseur, not a single great bar of chocolate has been invented. These dates in the 30s, I mean, they are very... I don't know why children at school, uh, instead of learning uh, 1066, William I and all the rest of it, uh, why don't they learn 1932 Mars Bar, 1934 Malteser, 1935 Aero? 19... Uh, these are worth knowing, That'd be good, these that, dates. Yeah. Yes, yeah, they yeah. are. Good, yeah. They're yeah. vital. Very interesting. Vital to every child. Who cares about William I and Henry IV? Yeah. Yeah. They don't. I don't know much about no, you, you don't, do you? Yeah. Mm. He was in the army, wasn't he? Henry. I think he was, yes. Yeah, he was. He yes. Was. So he's, he's he started it all off, I think, yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Good he was. Yeah. Yeah. Big fat fellow, wasn't he? That's Got married. Henry. Had lots of women. That's Henry VIII. Oh, Henry VIII? Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's that fellow playing that film, saw him. That was good, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. That wanted Treasure Island. Yes, that's right. With a leg. Yes. It's good, that. Yes. Like that. Hey, you lose something every day, don't you, Mum? What's all this then? A gnu and a gnoceros, surely we'll see. And that gnormous and gnorable gnat, whose sting, when it stings you, goes in at the knee and comes out through the top of your hat. We may even get lost and be frozen by frost. We may die in an earthquake or tremor. Or nastier still, we may even be tossed on the horns of a furious dilemma. Here, yeah, Ron, you're pulling my leg. We conclude our special weekend of Roald Dahl with an evening of sinister tales inspired by the man himself. Tales of the Unexpected is after the break. <laughs>